Pookies. Happy Thursday. We have a, we not only have a really gorgeous gallery that loves art on its walls. Every time I bring artists here, they say, oh, this is a nice gallery. And I say, wait till you see your work up on the walls. And then the work goes up on the walls and they go, oh my God, I really like this gallery. But we also have a terrific grant that was left to us by uh, two alums, the Rockwell brothers. And it allows us to bring uh, artists here from all over the country. Uh, we've even had an Australian artist up in our gallery. Today we have uh, Christine Mauersberger, who is from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And she's an artist who uses textiles, found materials, eco dyeing, and mark making, both drawn and stitched to create pieces that range from small and intimate to room-sized installations. Her work is featured in private and public collections. She's been the recipient of numerous fellowships and grants, including the Ohio Arts Council Award of Individual Excellence, a, a, <laughs> a $20,000 Creative Workforce Fellowship, and a Wingate Craft Artist Fellowship from the Vermont Studio Center. She lives and creates in her native Cleveland, Ohio, less than 10 miles away from the Slovak Civic Club, where her parents went dancing every Saturday night when she was growing up. Uh, we have a party tomorrow in the gallery from 5 to 7. Everyone is invited. Everyone, everyone, everyone. And I would like for you to welcome Christine Mauersberger. to sign in again. Okay. Come on. Wakey, wakey. This is not hypnotism. This is like your worst fear. You get in front of an audience and your computer decides that it's going to sleep a little longer, but fortunately, you're all here with me this morning. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Yay! Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Chick and the Taft School for inviting me to be the Rockwell Fellow this week. I'm happy to be here and glad that you came here to meet me this morning. I know about your age because I had a sleepover this weekend with my great nieces and they're like 17, 18, 19, 20 and they all slept in to about 11 o'clock so thank you for being here. Now this is not a movie poster from the next Stephen King film, no. It is my work. It's a work that I made in an abandoned house, and it's entitled Nest. Today, like the house itself, it no longer exists. I'm going to talk a bit today about my work, which is centered on the understanding of the passage of time, and show you my process and influences. Now, I'm gonna talk about this piece in a few moments. You can get anywhere you can see I truly believe this for me, and I believe it for you. If you can see it, if you could think about it, it can happen. And that is what my mother used to tell me. She actually used to say, if you think about it, do it. This is Timelines. Today, I'll be installing this piece in your gallery, in your fine gallery. Two women, two young women are going to help me install and they're going to have a great time with me. Um, this is made out of a plastic film called Ruby Lith, and I cut it up and sewed it onto a base of tulle. And Ruby Lith is what was used back before computers in graphic design. It's a masking film, but you might, be, you might know about it a little bit, the masking tool in Illustrator is pink. It's referring to Ruby Lith because light does not pass through it. I had a bunch of ruby lith, and I love the color, and it refers to so many things in my life. 
and I decided to make work using it. So I'm obsessed with the meaning of time. What's the meaning of time? Where does it go? Can we see it? Is it now, or now, or now? How can I convey time? So each one of these little red elements that you see that are starts and stops, to me, they represent moments in time. So how do I make the work? I first did a sketch. This is gouache on paper. This is where I made the work in my little home studio on a sewing machine. And I hired one of my nephews to hang up some rods for me so I can see it as I went. And this room is 12 by 14. So I'm making large work that I really don't know what it's really going to look like until it gets into the space. But I have the vision. Let's get back to that nest. In 2015, I was asked to participate in an event called Rooms to Let Cleveland, sponsored by the Cuyahoga County Land Bank. I live in Cuyahoga County, which is an Indian name, and you're familiar with that here in Connecticut. This event seeks to re-envision one of Cleveland's most diverse and authentic neighborhoods as it strives to illuminate a community in the midst of recovery. This zip code was and is the, well, was the epicenter for the foreclosure crisis in America. It's called Slavic Village because a lot of ethnic people lived there in about, from about 1920 through the 70s, lots of um, Polish, Slovak, Hungarian, because it's very close to the steel mills in Cleveland. And subsequently, the neighborhood has changed, and people can't afford to live there. And these houses become abandoned because they can't pay their mortgage. And then the houses get trashed. Um, and people come in and try to live in there, and horrible things happen. So the land bank has to decide which houses get raised. And it's really unfortunate. But they do everything they can to preserve the homes. And so what they do is they invite a bunch of us artists to come in and create work in the home and then have a big party for two days. And people come in and they're able to view the art and then the community has a big party and we're sort of drumming up this excitement about living there. So this is a picture of the house that was selected to be demolished that year. I had the capability of selecting two rooms. And as you could see, one is the inside of room, one's outside of the room. Look at all that trash, this wood. And you go in there, there's no bathroom. It's April, might be hot. And I'm not kidding when I say that there's people outside smoking pot right next door. Um, when you have to go to the restroom, you have to kind of plan. You're an artist, right? You have to plan, like, oh, I'm going to hop in my car and go to a mall. Here's the other room that I decided to use. So when you want to solve a problem, they said, OK, take some rooms. We want you to make something that refers to this neighborhood in some way. What's the best way to do that? You research. I went to the Cuyahoga County archives. And as you can see in these nine photos, I'm looking at maps. I'm looking at the old books. I'm finding pictures of the house. I wanted to know who lived here. What's the history of this house? I wanted this research to tell me what to do. Keep in mind, I didn't know I was going to make that nest when I started out. I had no idea. What I do is I jump in and say yes, and then say, OK, what am I going to make? And I also wanted to know why, why Northeast Ohio, where I live, is called the West, land of the Western Reserve. I thought I'd do a little research. Well, I live in the land of the Western Reserve of Connecticut. We have a connection, OK? In 1662, this area where I live became part of the colony of Connecticut, whose royal charter granted it a swath of land extending across the continent to the Pacific Ocean. Did you know that? I didn't. OK, I grew up listening to a pub, um, the classic music station. And it would say, WCLV, the land of the Western Reserve. 
And I just thought, well, that's very refined, you know. Um, so after the American Revolution, Connecticut ceded most of its lands, except for about three million acres, which is now Northeast Ohio. And it's like just west of Cleveland to the Pennsylvania border. And then in the 17, late 1700s, they sold that land to the Connecticut Land Company. And then they had to survey it. And they sent a guy named Moses Cleveland from Connecticut. And I live in Cleveland, his namesake. In fact, so what the first settlers that came to this area where I live were from Connecticut. And you'll find towns named Norwich, Saybrook, New London, Litchfield, Mansfield, Plymouth. I grew up with these names, not realizing that this was connected to Connecticut. In fact, you'll go to those towns and they have a town green or a square and a white steeple church common to Connecticut. Um, so as things proper, as pros prospered, um, less people from Connecticut moved there and immigrants came. Okay, back to this house. So I have two rooms I'm working with. And I decided to connect the two rooms because I thought, oh, there's two closets. If we cut a hole in it, you can walk from one room to the other. So I hired my nephew to cut a hole. And then in one room, you would see nest. Ah, who nested here? That research showed me the maps and um, all the deeds to the house, back to the handwritten deeds. And while I was doing the research on the computer, I found an app called Iographica, and I don't know if it exists anymore, but what it does is you could click on it and it will map where you're moving with your mouse. And I thought, ah, oh, okay. I'm going to do the next room. So you walk from nest, who nested here, you walk through the closets, and then you get into portal. And it's all the research I did in three dimensions with red and pink flag tape. The kind of tape you see when someone's doing a land survey. You've seen them on little pieces of wood and a surveyor putting a piece of yellow tape. Same stuff. And here in the middle you see something I call portal. So in one room, who nested here? The other, it's what's the future? Here you see the two rooms side by side. Um, and this photo was taken by a really good friend of mine. It's good to stay friends with people in high school. This was taken by a guy who was my first boyfriend. Um, I'm still friends with him, although I'm married. Um, uh, he became a photographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just said, <laughs> it, it, pays, it pays to stay friends with your friends, OK? Um, and he didn't charge me very much for this. And he hung out. So that very first picture you saw of the little boy with the blue jacket looking at the big nest, he took that picture. He hung out and caught random photos of people. And that picture is priceless. So it pays when you're doing artwork to have people who understand what you're trying to do. And then you use those photos for presentations like this or to win grants. Okay, but how did I know I was an artist, okay? How? Well, I'm the 11th of, no, wait. I'm the 10th child born of 11 in a second generation Polish Slovak American family of 12. I, this is all wrong. My mom had 12 births, but really there were 10 of us, 11 of us. All the nurses came to see me because of it. My mom said my eyes were open, they came in, they were happy I was normal. No, seriously, folks, really, my mom had three children who had Down syndrome. Her first child had Down syndrome and lived until he was in his 50s. The other two lived shorter lives. Um, but they persisted. Um, my second grade teacher, Sister Michelle, told me I was an artist, and I believed her. Here I am in 1978 as a 17-year-old looking very pensively at my artwork. My dad said, pose and hold your, your artwork. Um, I had a really great high school teacher who taught crafts. And like Miss Chick, I mean, she was so encouraging. And she took me to the Cleveland Museum of Art to this big event called Fiberworks. And I got to see all these textile artists. And I was hooked. 
And I made this when I was 16. Then after high school, I didn't go to college right away um, because I went for a semester and I hated it. Um, it was so brutal. Um, so I went to Vermont and studied with a master weaver. And uh, he was from Scotland, so I learned traditional weaving techniques. I eventually went to college and got my degree, folks. I was 30 when I graduated. It was a hard row to hoe. Get yourself into college and get it done, but you know, love what you're doing. I live in Cleveland, and as if I didn't know it, they put a sign that says Cleveland. But this is, um, I do a two mile walk from my house, so I'm able to see Lake Erie almost every day when I go for a walk. Here's one of my favorite views of Lake Erie, and I'm influenced by where I live. This is my house. It's a double. There's two apartments, but my husband and I live in the entire house. So the downstairs is dedicated to George. Here's some of his work. He just uh, retired as the drawing professor at Cleveland State University, which, by the way, I went to school there in my late 20s, and I ended up marrying him. I married my professor. Now. <laughs> Don't do this, okay? Yeah. I will tell you though, when you go to school, when you go to college, if your professor wants to date you, do not do it, okay? I was, I was 29, all right? Yeah, I was a little older. If a professor wants to date you, don't, because they're a jerk, okay? I'm sorry, that's it, all right? To use plain Eng English. Here he is, and um, no, I don't make him want to hit his head on a table, but that's a self-portrait. He's pretty well known in Cleveland and has won many awards. Um, if you go to uh, Progressive Field, he's got drawings in some of the dugout suites. Um, he also does watercolors. He, I grow flowers, he takes pictures, and he paints them. I also do watercolors, and you will see some of these in the gallery, and I want you to come in the gallery and see these, all right? I respond differently to my environment than my husband George does. He's, he does high realism. I'm doing abstract work because I'm thinking about time and moments and moments and moments, these abstract marks. These two works are two of four that are in the gallery, and I really want you to go and see these. Um, the one that has the more muted colors that look like nature, those are watercolors that are handmade by my friend in Vancouver, BC, who goes into the forest, and she forages for natural pigments and then makes watercolors. And I bought them from her, and I, painted with them and I love them as much as I love working with traditional watercolors. I'm influenced by a Canadian-born American abstract painter. Her name is Agnes Martin. Um, she, she's often considered or referred to as a minimalist and she considered herself an abstract expressionist. Um, I will tell you a quick story. My friend Corinne, when Agnes was alive, she ended, her last years were in, it was in New Mexico. So my friend Corinne boldly went and called her up when she was in New Mexico and had lunch with her, got picked up and had gin and tonics with this woman who was just a real recluse. Um, I love that. Um, here I've got two short videos. I love to make marks. And I'm thinking, okay, so I stitch marks, which you'll see in a minute, but I like to draw. And then I can take those drawings and make them into screen prints. Right? You've, I don't think you do screen printing here, but you're familiar with t-shirts that can screen printed. Um, I believe that drawing and doodling are hypnotic and freeing. And this is the place we all want to get to in our work. The more we practice, the more we learn to slip into it with ease. Because you practice, you practice an instrument, you practice a sport, practice art. Art is a practice. You're not, some people are innately gifted. That really doesn't happen. It, 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 you practice, practice, practice. 
Ms. Chickadance is so good at what she does because she's been doing it for a long time. Thousands. Thousands of years. So when you practice, and you have to notice the state of being you're in, at least I do. Because when you're in that state of being, it's called flow. Okay. Um, so here's that drawing I did where it's printed onto paper. This piece is in the gallery. Um, the, I feel that the only way to understand something is by making it. You could think all day long and be a conceptual artist and get nothing done. Concepts and ideas must be knitted into the structure of one's being. And this can only be done by one's own activity. Again, think about how you practice a skill. Here, I've printed it on linen that I imported from Lithuania. I commissioned a group of Lithuanian weavers to make me some linen and dye it and send it to Cleveland and then I print it on it, which is great. Um, here, I print it onto uh, paintings I did and these paintings are using alcohol ink on a substrate called Yupo, which is a machine made paper in the United States of 100% polypropylene. It's waterproof, stain resistant, and extremely strong and durable, but it's not porous. So whatever, whatever you use onto Yupo, watercolor, oil, anything, it, it just rests, and then you have to let it dry, and you have to spray it with some fixative so it doesn't flake off. And so I had these pieces. They're about 20, 36 by 24. And I've been do I was doing screen printing earlier this year, and I thought, I'm going to screen print. Can you see the marks on those, the little, little marks? They almost look like fish. Oh, so I posted this on Instagram, and our consultant contacted me, and within two weeks, three of these were sold to a um, Baker Hostetler in Chicago, which is a law firm that you might work at someday, and you might see them. Um, I am concerned about water, as we all should be, and the state of water, especially plastics and water. In 2017, I was invited by a group of people in Quebec who said, we want you to make some work for our Biennale about linen, because this is where linen was made, and we love linen. And you can make anything you want, but it has to be about linen, using linen, or refer to linen. But wait, you have to use this prompt. It was, what goes unnoticed? Not just what goes unnoticed, but they sent me a poem in French. And fortunately, I have a niece who can speak French. And she says, OK, it's what ceaselessly menaces the important? What is unimportant, but ceaselessly menaces the important? I'm like, oh my god. It took me about six months to figure out, what am I going to make? Well. Plastic is a menace to water, and we can't see it necessarily. Those plastic gyres in our oceans and in our waterways, I've been told you cannot see it when you're on the water or above the earth. You have to be in a boat and scoop up the water, and then you see plastic. And so I thought, what if I made something that looked like beautiful water, but when you got close, you saw plastic? So here's a side view of the piece in a convent that was built in the 1700s, by the way, and they had never let anything go in the ceiling, and they let me screw screws into the ceiling. That was another story. But you see on the um, right some little discs. Those are plastic. I didn't want to use real garbage. I want it to be a symbolism of garbage. Um, and before I made the work, I had to give them a proposal just as you learn to write papers here, you must also use your skills when you need to do a proposal. For me, I used Illustrator to convey my idea. I had a vision. What am I going to make? This is what I'm going to make. OK, I need to draw it. I need to tell them what it is. I need to explain to them all the materials I'm going to use. So I'm showing you an example of the kind of work I do professionally. Sometimes you think artists are not prepared. You might have this misnomer. We are very prepared. Um, we have to work really hard to understand budgets 
and how to convey our ideas to people. Uh, Lake Erie is plagued every summer with harmful algae blooms. This concerns me to no end because the Great Lakes are one of the few places in the world with fresh water and it's being harmed by fertilizer runoff because of a certain political strength in Ohio right now that allows farmers to continue to use fertilizer that runs off near the Maumee River on the western basin of Lake Erie and then algae feeds on it and they bloom. Now all algae isn't bad but this algae is and it chokes out life. So I was part of another event in Cleveland where I was tasked to do something whatever I wanted in that hallway and I went to Habitat for Humanity and found a roll of clear plastic film for 20 bucks and I thought I'm going to paint on this using alcohol inks and hang it and express this wow this looks beautiful but when you read what it's about I called it poisonous beauty because it looks like a beautiful piece but really it's talking about the harmful effects of algae Here's my hand stitching. This piece is in the studio, I mean the gallery. You'll notice that I'm trying to convey time with starts and stops. It's almost like um, an LP. You, you might not know about those, but people are playing records again and you know, the disc that goes around and the starts and stops. I also like to stitch on small things that I find. I found some sea grape leaves down in Sanibel and I had some thread and I thought wow I'd like to stitch on these so I did. I'm influenced by a woman named Louise Despont. She is a French artist who lives in Indonesia with her architect husband and child. She does these massive drawings on vintage leather, um, ledger paper and it's just incredible because this is where she's working. That's outside like her living room opens up like there's no windows um, and she started making these kites which I'm obsessed with every time she posts I can't even and what's really cool about Instagram is you could write to anybody and they'll write back to you and I've written to her a couple times and had conversations and I like that about artists here's one of my pieces that's in the gallery um, because it's you know my work is concerned about the progression of time I call this guide I call this a, a self-portrait there's me floating around in that little piece that you see and it looks like a map because maps usually have ledgers to refer so I thought why not this is in the shape of a skirt and it represents a woman um, I do think that drawing and hand stitching are related and they're both time-based mediums. The marks that create drawings never happen at once but show traces of movement in the same way that your thoughts meander through a labyrinth. That's how I approach everything I do. Okay, so this is more hand stitching. I'm, I'm uh, uh, influenced by this woman who is a German Jewish Jewish artist and I made this work for the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts in Michigan uh, a place in Belgium saw it and they used it in their opera guide for Madame Butterfly I made another piece that was at the Ohio Arts Council here's the second abandoned house I do uh, drawings of tessellations and I decided that, and you could sort of see, here's the progression, I'm in an abandoned house, and I drew all over the walls. I thought that the drawing was a lovely metaphor for how we are all connected to one another. Here's inside the closet. If you place your camera on the floor and put the timer on and have it uh, go off, it, you could get some lovely um, results. What am I doing next? Remember these I just showed you, the tessellations? Well, an art consultant showed these to an art committee to, for a local college, I'll go back. Uh, they're doing a new STEM building, science, technology, engineering, and math, and they said, maybe she could make it in three dimensions. And I thought, uh, okay. 
So I'm figuring out how to make tessellations in three dimensions and hang it in that space. Right now, as we speak, my assistant, Evan, is using this uh, pigment called Lit, which is the glowiest glow pigment. That's Stuart Semple in the UK. If you go on his website, Culture Hustle, he'll say, this is the glowiest glow pigment ever, and I created it. Um, and it's super cool. It's not day glow. You just, it, has to, it has to be exposed to light, and then it will glow for 12 hours. So some of the tubes will have glow pigment in it, and I thought that would be really awesome. Um, so this is what I did two weeks ago. Well, actually, the whole summer. Uh, this is my most challenging artwork I ever did. A consultant wrote to me and said, you know that red work that you do? Can you do the same thing, but using blue jeans, zippers, belts, leather, for a brand new boutique hotel in Columbus, Ohio? And I said, yes, here's the drawing. In an elevation of the hotel. And they said yes, and I thought, oh my goodness, I can't make this at home, so I found a studio. And this is my studio. It's got 14 foot high ceilings, and I needed it to sort of replicate where it would be. Uh, here, you could see I've collected blue jeans, and I decided to use reflective zippers, and I imported those from China. Um, and use those, and I think the reflective zippers are super cool because when they flash lights on it, it's gonna reflect, and it's a big party hotel. Here I am in the heat of summer this year with no air conditioning and big industrial fans trying to finish this piece. I was really suffering. Here's that reflective zipper. I mean, how cool is this? I wanna do an installation just with these zippers. Here's the installation a few weeks ago. I made a map, had it printed out, and the guys on the lift drilled holes in that beautiful new wooden ceiling. We installed it. This is a picture from below. This is it from above. And here's a side view. What you do is where you see that man on the floor, you walk into the hotel, and once the stairs are completed, you'll be able to walk up around it and then go to the bar where you uh, sign in to the hotel and they give you a drink. So I don't think any of you can go there yet, but it's called Moxie and it's a brand that's all over the world and it's all about party. And then here it is, finished, and I call it wrapped and this is a wrap. Thank you very much. <laughs>